hour here. Mercifully, Friday is almost over for us. Um, And so Tim, we've got, um, since we've really been um, on a roll with your bills today, uh, the committee's got the draft, I think. Uh, this is got some updates in draft 3.2. Um, so do you want to? run us through the suggested changes here while we're running a couple minutes ahead and then we'll um, take the testimony from our witnesses. Well, thank you very much for having me, Chair McCarthy. Again, for the record, my name is Tim Devlin, Legislative Counsel. And before you, you have draft 3.2 of the bill, um, which is uh, dated today, this morning. Then also I have uh, updated the bill summary, which I uh, believe uh, Andrea has just um, posted to the website just a few minutes ago, <laughs> when I got to her a few minutes ago, that is. So um, the real significant changes to this draft um, have been um, really the removal of the subsection D of 1992, which had uh, permitted um, a vote of the legislative body to be voided. And then also the removal of the prior uh, section 1994, uh, having to do with employment restrictions uh, has also been removed. Uh, this is restricted municipal employees from seeking outside employment that would conflict with their position, advocating on matters related to their position after leaving office and sharing confidential information. That's been removed. And actually, it's been replaced, I should say, rather than completely removed. The section number has been replaced. Um, now you'll find inserted a <laughs> guidance and advisory opinions. Um, section that replicates the guidance and advisory opinion sections of the state ethics code, that is 3 VSA 1225, uh, which will enable the executive director of the state ethics commission uh, to provide guidance and advisory opinions to any individual with respect to a municipal officer's duty regarding the municipal code of ethics and any other issues related to government ethics. And then aside from those uh, three large changes, um, some of the uh, nomenclature has been updated just to make sure there's consistency with, uh, I think there's a few off references to um, office uh, official versus officer. Also, the definition of um, uh, legislative body has been updated somewhat to include reference to um, uh, fire uh, districts. And let me see if there's anything else here. Um, okay, I uh, and then I should say, um, really, that's about it. There's a little bit in a preferential treatment, but perhaps we can get there um, if we go through. Um, and that kind of sums up the, oh, sorry, I should say, um, also there, uh, the trainings um, references, both the initial trainings for in-office municipal officers in Section 4 and existing in session law, and then also the to be added to statute new language uh, regarding uh trainings for um, municipal officers has been somewhat updated. It's replicated in both. And this essentially shifts it from a hour requirement to um, really having training be completed um, uh, in a manner and really designed in a manner as to achieve improved competency in the subject matter. That is rather than rely on fixed hours of training. And that, I believe, uh, summarizes all the training, uh, sorry, all the updates since uh, version two. Um, Chair McCarthy, would you like me to go through the specific language now or just kind of leave it there for now? Um, I think that um, since we have um, some witnesses that I, that I believe are going to give more general testimony, I might say that um, we can kind of pull Sure. Doing a more detailed walkthrough. Um, the big takeaways that I just wanted to get on the table was that, you know, we're in this draft starting to really respond to some of the league's feedback and others about making this, you know, really a little bit more sanded down for um, Vermont municipalities. So the idea of, you know, the, that kind of complete prohibition on uh, being employed. Uh, 
within a year that that you know would have potentially created some problems. We've removed that language. We've removed that voidability language that had become kind of a focus. So um, we're trying to get down to a cleaner version of the bill that really gets at the conflict of interest and other issues that I think are the preferential treatment, for instance, that are kind of the, at the top of the priority list for um, the State Ethics Commission and the supporters of the bill. So uh, appreciate uh, Tim, your work and kind of the iterative nature of both of these ethics bills, uh, you put in a ton of time. You're very welcome. Um, I will um, just uh, go off screen then and stand by if needed for questions. Thank you so much. All right, so let me make sure that uh, now that the directors here that have a sense of the rock show. Uh, so uh, would you like to have the commissioners testify First, does that seem like the best? <laughs> okay, great. Um, so is Mr. Olram. Uh... Glad to testify, but I would suggest Michelle um, get uh, testify first. She works with an accounting firm and knows crunch time. Okay, wow. Well, thank you for deferring. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Michelle, welcome. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Can you hear me okay? Maybe. Okay, now I'm good. Yes, I Thank can you. hear you fine. And we're hearing you loud and clear. Uh, thanks for being with us. So I just um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background. I won't talk very long at all. And I basically wanted to leave myself open for any questions that you might have. Um, I joined the commission in April of 2019. So I'm coming up on my five years with the commission. During that time, we had a lot of stuff going on, the ethics that finally became law in 22. And thank you so much to the legislature for doing that. I was so excited that day. And, um, you know, then we started with the municipal ethics. And what, what we found over the past five years that I've been a commissioner is that more and more people were asking, well, you know, I don't have any place I can go to, you know, for ethics on municipalities and things. And of course, we had no way that we could do anything with it. It wasn't within our charter that we were given by the legislature, though we were finally asked by you to come up with something. Um, I joined the commission back in April of 19 because I really, really wanted to help the people of Vermont and I felt that this was a way, besides telling them that they owe too much in taxes or something like that, that I could help them, you know, with a really important part of the whole governmental scene and individual scene of ethics and, and how it relates. Um, I had originally been on the tax advisory committee appointed by Governor Douglas and realized how much I enjoyed being able to do things that would benefit Vermont and its citizens. So that's why I kind of said yes when they were looking for a representative from the CPA Society. Um, what I found out recently, and I appreciated the comments from Carol yesterday, or not yesterday, a couple of days ago, I listened to it at night, um, is that I've gone to the Kogel conferences, I've gone to two of them, that's the Council on uh, governmental ethics legislation, I believe, if I have it right, Carol. But I've gone to two conferences and have learned a lot from other states. But this most recent one that I went to in December, they talked about the whole, um, there was a lot of finance, campaign finance issues, but the few places I went to about the municipal ethics, you know, that states are starting to really look at it if they haven't already. And the one thing that I learned is, yes, you know, there needs to be enforcement later on. You know, that's not what we're talking about now, but they talk about how training and if it's done right can influence the amount of non uh, ethical complaints, the amount of them, how many will go down. If you have the training out there right, that it will 
solve a problem of having to enforce too much because people are getting the training of what could be kind of scrutinized and everything else. So um, that's basically my background. You know, I've been a CPA for 28 years. Don't look at my picture on the website. That's a really old one and I need to update it, but I, I swear I am really Michelle Eyed <laughs> CPA. <laughs> But um, if anybody has any questions for me, I'm more than happy to answer them or give you any other background information you'd like. Well, Ms. I, I think the, the overarching thing that we wanted to get a sense from, um, we've been deep in the weeds talking about the, the language in these bills for a few weeks now. Uh, and in your experience over the last few years as a commissioner, I'm wondering, um, you know, what are the kinds of issues, the ethical issues that the State Ethics Commission is helping with? What are the things you see as needs where we're not meeting, you know, the needs of municipalities, especially with the powers that the Ethics Commission has now? Um, you know, if you were going to make a pitch to somebody, uh, especially the people around this table, for why we need a municipal code of ethics, I think that's that's the biggest thing from your perspective uh, that we're trying to get it, get today. Okay. Um, probably the biggest thing is I really hate to disappoint people. Okay. And if we're getting calls because a person feels that there's been preferential treatment or, um, uh, somebody's involved in too many pies in state, in uh, municipal government or something like that, and they want to know who they can complain to or who they can talk to about it. And to this point, we can't even talk to them. And, you know, our office does a, an incredible job with talking to, kind of getting to the, the meat of an issue when somebody calls up and says, you know, this is my problem. This is what I think, you know, what do you think? And, you know, we either give them guidance, we give them advisory stuff, or we send them on to whichever um, organ a state government organization that would take care of it. In the case of municipalities, we have to say to them, well, call your legislator or yeah, you want some more calls on that, right? Um, okay. Call your legislator, call um, Secretary of State's office. They don't want any more of them either. And, or go to the gov your municipal government. Well, that's kind of where they're coming from in the first place. You know, you're not going to, if you're getting um, screwed by someone, you're not going to go to that person and complain that you're getting screwed. You're going to try to get somebody else to help. And I apologize for not being more formal with that language, but that's the way. You I know, it's it. Friday afternoon, and this is when we tend to get a little punchy. I think you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> but anyway, that's that's really, we need to be able to assist the people of Vermont in the ones that have real concerns about conflict of interest and everything else that are like a lot of the calls and what can they do about it. And I think by this municipal bill, and I read the changes this morning and it looks great, I, I think that's a way for us to show the people that we really do mean that we're going to try to do something. You know, I've been on the commission and had to hear all the comments. Well, you've got no teeth. You know, what good is the uh, commission right now? And, you know, we I hopefully we've proved it by coming up with the state statute. And now based on what the legislature tr had us do is to come up with municipal ethics that we are making a difference. And that is really important to me. Um, I also wanted to ask, uh, what kind of a time commitment is it to be a commissioner on the State Ethics Commission right now? What kind of a what? What kind of a time commitment has it to be that accountant appointee on the... <laughs> well, I definitely tell them I don't make the April meeting unless there's a vote that needs to happen. Yeah. But, um, you know, it it varies. Um in 19, we were coming up with the state code of ethics, not a statute, but the code of ethics. And, you know, there was a lot of extra time involved in reading over things and stuff like that. 
Um, then you have a lot of the meetings are just we're talking about in, in um, executive session about complaints that have been received and, and things like that. Most of our meetings will go somewhere um, usually close to two hours, and that's only once a month, but there's a lot of outside work too that we need to kind of research and make sure we understand what's going on, look at draft bills, you know, that can't all be done in a two hour meeting. So um, I, you know, if I had to put an estimate on my time as a commissioner, then I'd probably say somewhere around 10 to 15 hours a month, but um, it's kind of off and on. It could be less, could be a little more, you know, it's been a little more lately, but I uh, gladly do it. I mean, do I get compensated a little bit, but not anywhere near what I could be earning here at the office for 10 to 15 hours worth of billable work? Well, we appreciate your service. Anybody else on the committee have any questions for Ms. Hyatt? Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I really appreciate it. No problem. I'd like to just kind of hang around. I'll go off screen, but um, yeah, please do. Listen. If okay. you if you do want to raise your hand or or chime in, uh, if you do want to comment on something, I'm uh, definitely open to that in this <laughs> in this particular hearing. Uh, you know, you shouldn't have said that because <laughs> members of the commission will tell you how much I love to uh, comment on things. <laughs> but <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Paul, would you like to join us up at the table? Sure, glad to. Thanks for being with us today. Oh, of course. And uh, good afternoon to everybody. And, and, and thank you, Chair McCarthy and the committee for, for inviting me to testify today. Uh, I, I don't want to go over what Michelle just said, except to say that I will echo everything she said. I agree with everything Michelle said. Uh, and, and I, I could discuss the details of these two bills, uh, but instead I figured I'd just spend a few minutes trying to put a human face and a human voice um, to the Ethics Commission. Um, so I'm the chair of the Ethics Commission. Um, I, I joined the Ethics Commission in early, I guess it was February 2019, just a few months before Michelle. Um, and uh, just speaking about myself for a few minutes, I, I, I read for the bar, I passed the bar in 1986. I was an assistant attorney general for five years. I went into private practice, uh, mostly appellate work and representing members of the disabilities community. Um, I worked for the Vermont Human Rights Commission for 15 years. Um, and I left the commission and retired from state service in 2015. I also retired my license to practice law, uh, but nonetheless, I continue volunteering uh, with attorneys who do pro bono work. I, I put in a lot of time actually doing that. Um, as far as being on the commission, when I was appointed in 2019, there were, as you know, there were very few workable ethics, low the laws, guidelines, enforcement mechanisms. Um, and also in 2019, the Ethics Commission was hurting, um, just beginning to recover from a misstep it had taken in 2018, which um, uh, somehow <laughs> united the three parties, all <laughs> condemning the act of the Ethics Commission. I don't need to go into it unless you really want to hear the gory details, uh, but we were, <laughs> the, the reputation was recovering. And I think that since then, we have recovered well. I'll go into that in a moment. But just to say, um, Michelle mentioned the COGO conference, a, a gathering of um, go state governmental agencies and good government organizations that come together once a year uh, to work on issues of ethics and you know, workshops, et cetera. Uh, I went as a, as a newbie, as a, a new member of the Ethics Commission, um, and to be honest, I was kind of embarrassed being there because I was hearing stories from all, many other ethics commissions, um, their scope of authority, their, um, their accomplishments. And they'd ask, so what are you doing in Vermont <laughs> for ethics? I'd have to admit, basically, we're toothless. We don't have clear guidelines, et cetera. Um, so I'm so thankful that this committee, in well, just two years ago, 
unanimously passed the, the state ethics code, which is a set of guidelines. And then that went on to uh, be passed unanimously in the House and in the Senate. Uh, a fantastic first step. Um, I think that the commission has re recovered from its misstep in 2018. Uh, I think, I hope that it has regained a reputation, its good reputation with legislators and the citizens of the state of Vermont. Um, and, and of course we have a superb executive director as you probably already know. And I am thankful to work with uh, four really wonderful and smart uh, ethics commissioners. I, I think we have a good group. Um, <laughs> um, and so, as you know, the Vermont ethics puzzle still has some missing pieces, municipal ethics and uh, some sort of enforcement protocol. Um, but that's it. We're working on it. Um, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I'm open to any questions you might have. I, again, I just want to put a human face, a human voice to the Ethics Commission. So um, we have been uh, wrestling with some concepts in here. Um, and I, I wanted to, before we kind of dive back into the details of the bill and thinking about you know who different provisions apply to, um, kind of take a step back this afternoon and, and talk to you about the work that you're doing. Uh, but I don't want to shy away from the conversations about specific elements. One of the things that we've really been um, struggling with, I think, is in regards to the municipal code of ethics, um, this idea of sort of where should the, um, the, the sort of place for complaints live? Um, you know, we, we've gotten some pretty strong testimony from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns um, that it has cautioned us. Um, I think in this draft, we've sought to remedy some of the things that the Municipal Clerks and Treasurers Association and the League uh, said, you know, might be a little too much for uh, the municipal code at this point. Um, but I'm wondering if, if you have thoughts around the capacity of the ethics commission, you know, assuming that we provide at least an additional attorney um, to be able to, uh, you know, engage in the work with municipalities that needs to be done both on the training front and on the calls and complaints that you might now have the ability to respond to. Um, you know, if you feel like you can tackle all of those things, if we, to provide some additional staffing resources. I do believe that we could handle um, municipal ethics complaints if we had adequate staffing. Uh, you get a better idea from Chris Siver what kind of staffing we'd need. My uh, understanding is that up to half of the phone calls and other messages we get are with regard to municipalities and not with regard to state public servants. So. I don't know if one additional attorney would be <clears throat> enough, frankly. Um, and addressing the question of where is the correct place for these complaints to go, I do think that questions of governmental ethics should and even must stay with government as opposed to some independent um, advocacy organization. I, I've, I've worked with Vermont League of Cities and Towns in the past. I respect them. They do wonderful work. Um, <laughs> But their job is to advocate for uh, cities and towns um, and to protect select board members, uh, city council members, et cetera. Um, I, I, I think, I'm just repeating myself, I, I think the right place would be the Ethics Commission. And, or, you know, somebody certainly within the state of Vermont. Any questions for our Ethics Commission chair? Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I hope you'll stick around too for. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much. Um, so, Director Sibrit, um, I know you've given us kind of a, a higher level summary of what the state code does. Do you think it would be useful to kind of bring the, the committee back up to the 10,000 foot level? Um, <laughs> um, was trying as we think about this over the weekend and prepare to try to get into some final drafting on both of these bills over the next week or so um, to kind of leave the committee with uh, 
sort of a framing of what we're trying to do because I, I had been feeling even myself getting kind of lost in the weeds and the complexity of thinking about what would be on disclosure forms. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. Um, I, yeah, and I just want to say, because I know uh, Paul brought up an instance where there was like a hiccup in the early, early days of the Ethics Commission. And I want to bring that, that up as an example of like why a code is needed. So I believe at the time I wasn't there. Um, so, and I wasn't really involved in the details, but I do know that there was an outside organization that asked for an opinion on a loan taken out by the governor that may or may not have been commercially reasonable. And so that was the, and so the Ethics Commission did issue an advisory opinion. I think there was some controversy over whether they, whether they should have done it or not, but it was that time when there was no code of ethics in place. There was no clear guidelines. And so if the, code, the state code of ethics had been in place at the time, there would have been much more clear guidelines. There would have been, first of all, an outside organization wouldn't have been able to ask for an advisory opinion. That was one issue because advisory opinions only cover um, one's own conduct. But again, all those rules would have been placed and you would have been us the very clear guidelines about what is you know, correct to have and what is not correct. And the perception that something wrong was happening it could have been something that the governor might have wanted to ask for himself just to clear up those issues, you know, for example. Um, so I wasn't there, but I just wanted to give that as an example of um, where a code of ethics, having a code of ethics is actually beneficial. All right, I'm sorry. So I thought I would just take it back to, yeah, um, a higher level when we're looking at uh, the municipal code of ethics and using the state code of ethics as a framework, um, because I mentioned before that the state code of ethics is, you know, covers very basic principles. And um, so what we did at the time, because it does look like very convoluted, it does look like it could be very burdensome um, when you're looking at, you know, the 16 pages of languages there, but what it's actually doing is quite simple. And so what it does, and this is, yeah, I'm using the state code of ethics as a reference because I did do this distillation two years ago. Um, I haven't had time to do it for the municipal code of ethics. I don't know if you have the opportunity to see this distillation, but what the code essentially does is it says who is subject to the code of ethics, um, it says who is not subject to the code of ethics, then it details the core provisions that are included in that code. And so what we're talking about here are just very basic profession, very basic provisions that cover conflicts of interest, the rules for when and how you have to disclose a conflict of interest. It tells you not to direct others to act unethically, which basically just says public servants or in this case, municipal officers could not direct others to do what they cannot do ethically themselves. Don't participate in a matter after you've recused yourself avoid the appearance of unethical conduct, don't give people preferential treatment, show favoritism, don't use your state position for improper personal or financial, financial gain, don't use state information for improper financial gain, don't use state resources other than for what their intended purpose is, um, don't take gifts if they're meant to influence you, um, and don't make unauthorized commitments on behalf of the municipality. Um, and we've taken out the limits on other employment. I believe there is a reference to um, not having personal involvement in a contract. Um, if you are a municipal official and you are involved in that contract, but that's basically it. So it's actually quite a short list of things um, that people are prohibited from doing under the code of ethics and frankly things that people should already be doing already. But I don't think there's anything that's conceptually, you know, ambiguous here. I don't think there's anything that's going, you know, off track in terms of just what are standard ethical provisions that we find everywhere. And we have them, you know, encapsulated in a very clear, clear way, clear law. This is what you should do. This is what you shouldn't do. If there's confusion regarding a specific set of facts, come ask us at the Ethics Commission and we'll help walk you through it. And so I do think that we are out of place that, you know, we did hear from Motley of Cities and Towns and we heard from Carol Dawes. Um, there seems to be agreement that there should be uniform principles that cover everyone. And there does seem to be pretty good agreement about what those principles should be. I took a look at the document that Vermont League of Cities and Towns um, submitted two days ago, and their language was different. The principles that were encapsulated in that document were the same as what are in the Municipal Code of Ethics that has been before you this last few weeks. So it does seem like we really do agree in that core area. I think maybe the question has been the process by um, which those uh, principles are put into law, shall you say. And so from our perspective, there's in simplicity. And so you feel like doing it at the state level is the simplest way to do it. We tried another way when you had the uh, voluntary adoption or, or the required adoption of a conflict of interest provisions, but then it was kind of left up to municipalities as to exactly when and how they were going to do that, even though they were given some general guidelines. 
Um, so we tried that way. Uh, we tried it, and again, we've had these conversations when it came to state code of ethics, because there was a question, should each agency just, you know, ramp up their own policies? Should we just let them do it, give them some general guidelines? And that was on the table with state code of ethics. And we say, and this was a conversation that took place on the Senate side. They said, how about we just give them some general ideas and then let each branch of government develop their own? And it was decided that, no, that was not the way that we should do it. We should have one set of principles in law. And it's important that it's important to make the decision between a law and a policy. And I made the point that each we want there to be a common understanding amongst the people who the code applies to, but also amongst the public. So that's what happens when we have that one standard that is set into law at this higher level, then everyone develops a common understanding. You, you develop a common um, culture when it comes to government ethics. And so that was something that was discussed previously when it came to state code. And it was a decision that was made by the committee at the time that no, ultimately it was better to put this into state law and have a state code that applied equally to all branches of government. So we had that had that conversation before, but um, just continuing on in that vein a little bit, what we're really looking for here is simplicity. We're looking for, and we're looking for the ethics commission to be able to provide services. So I don't want to, that to get lost. We, what we're looking to do for municipalities, we don't even have enforcement in front of us, is we're looking to help them. And in order for us to be able to help them, we do need that one standard that you know comes into place at the same time. <laughs> Not you know this year, one comes in this year, next year, six months, using the same language so that when somebody calls us, we can actually give them that guidance that's been built up over time with a common understanding. It's going to make things much more clear for everyone. It's going to make it easier to provide those services. And ultimately, I think you're gonna see that people really appreciate the fact that this has been done. There's always, I think, worries about what could happen. When we looked at the state code of ethics, people really had a lot of fears and I don't think those fears have like come to be. Um, we really have not seen any problems with the state code of ethics. At least we're not hearing anyone complain about it. And from our perspective, it's working quite well. And as you can see, you know, last year we had, um, I think, 20 requests for guidance. We had 29 complaint inquiries. We had 15 complaints. Um, we had other kinds of inquiries compared to the year before. We had three complaints, you know, maybe a dozen complaint inquiries, maybe like a couple of requests for guidance. So people are starting to use our services more because they see the value of them. And that's happening as they learn about us more. And to Paul's to Paul's point, you know, he's right. We're arguing those municipal calls already that we can't do much with. Um, we do try to help people to the extent that we can. And I do think that if we had another attorney, that I do think that as a starting place, we had one attorney who could really focus on municipal ethics. I do think now, especially since we're not going to be delving into complaints, we're really going to be focusing on training, advice, and guidance. That that is a good starting place. And that in the future, if we need more, we'll know that we need more. Um, but the idea is that, that that one particular position would be focused on um, municipalities and providing in-person training. So there's the online training that we do try to make very compact, 45 minutes to an hour, because we know that people, their attention span gets lost. We learned this when we developed the state code of ethics, the training is online. And I'll say it's not as engaging as it could be. We <laughs> try to do it very quickly, but in working with CAPS, they were like, no, please make this as short as possible because they spend, you know, all day training people. They have their specialists over there. So I said the key is to make it short, clear, concise, and then people walk away with a clear understanding of what information was there without trying to drag it out and have people lose interest. So having like one concise, strong online training and then have the availability of someone from the Ethics Commission to come and give in-person trainings when requested, I think that's a, a really good starting place for us here. And then the ability to give um, advice and guidance. And Using us again as kind of like a sort of a pass when it comes to complaints, we'll provide those services to people in the sense we can help them with their complaints, let them know if this is really an ethics issue, but it's also a form of data collection. So that we'll get a better understanding how many complaints are actually out there. We know we have the Secretary of State's office is categorizing complaints as ethics complaints and tracking data over here, but this will allow us to do that to, do that to um, another extent. So then we come back in the future to look at what's working, what's not working, what we need to change, what don't we need to change. We'll have a, a better data set in front of us too as well. For the record, second. Second. Are we kind of asking questions in regards to the latest draft? Or if you would like, yeah, we have a little time here. I also wanted to um, give the lead some time um, before we hit the three o'clock hour. Uh, if I would like to give us some further comments, um, he had sent yesterday um, a number of. Um, edits to the, the last draft, some of the 
Uh, technical changes have been incorporated here by Legislative Council. I haven't really had time myself and I think other folks uh, in the last 24 hours to, to read over everything. So it may be that some of those suggestions are great and we just haven't quite gotten there yet, Ted. I just wanted to let you know, I, I haven't abandoned the, the, the document that you said, I just haven't had time to process it yet. So, but go ahead, yeah. Well, you know, I can wait as well. You know, I can listen to you from, from BLTC and come from there. Yeah, and if, if there are, you know, if there are specific areas of concern though, I'd love to just sort of flag them and say, I've got a, a concern or a question about this because I want to try to get to a place where we're starting to uh, hone in on what might be you know, the, the final structure and then over the, I, the I next week. Just quickly then, uh, again, in looking at the latest draft here, and I'm, and I'm not, um, this is on the, um, in particular, the uh, conflict of interest piece. Um, and just, you know, it, it seems, and I've mentioned this before, it seems like an awful lot for me to, uh, for those folks to do um, and I, I noticed that we don't even have to do that in the legislature. I mean, I haven't seen that if I, if I recuse myself, uh, especially on the floor, it's just an approval, uh, a recusal under, you know, um, Article 75 or whatever, right? And, and so I just I just think that particular piece is, is a little bit over the top. Um, yeah, and, and I guess even to go further, um, I'll find it here again. Yeah, it looks like there's some new wording here uh, under preferential treatment. Right? A municipal officer shall act impartially and not unduly favor or prejudice any person. And, then, and I understand that because that goes both ways. But then you get into the next section that says an officer shall not give or represent an ability to give undue preference or special treatment to any person because of their personal wealth position, status, or because of a person's personal relationship. And I mean, that's kind of specific one way, at least in my reading. And, I, and I'm just wondering about the other way, the other prejudice way, and, and why there's nothing in regards to that. Maybe that would be a little bit difficult. I mean, you could, what is you, could, you could prejudice somebody in the sense that uh, you have a business dealing with them uh, on a personal level, and you're you're not going to support whatever they're coming before the board with. Uh, and and uh, again, it could be you know an opposite way as far as um, wealth goes. I mean, you might think, oh, geez, this person really could use a leg up, so I'm going to support this person for it instead of. The other person is more qualified because this person I feel needs a leg up. I mean, those are the, that's what I'm saying. That's, that's what I'm saying about the imbalance. I see. And I think you could probably change it to financial status. I think maybe using the word wealth is uh, maybe throwing it off a bit. So generally speaking, I mean, people are always going to have some kind of personal bias. What we're looking to get at here is you have a personal bias for a specific reason that's going to relate to your relationship or because, you know, when, when we talk about Wealth, but we're really talking about like the ability for that person in the future to do you a favor. So you're kind of looking for a quid pro quo in that situation. So those are the types of situations that we're trying to get at there. When you're talking about somebody who is going to um, act um, in a way to punish someone, I think we're kind of getting in a situation where we're looking at conflict of interest, potentially retaliation. And so those would be covered under those situations. Okay. And when it comes to conflict of interest, I the situation you mentioned where it said um, if you are going to recuse yourself, you would make a statement. That's exactly the same in the, this code of ethics. So if you're going to recuse yourself, you just have to make a public statement. Um, and that means tell somebody else. That means say it in a public meeting. But you don't have to do more than that. You only have to fill out the form if you agree that you have the, a, a conflict of interest with the appearance of one, but you think it's okay for you to go forward. That's when you make the filing. Yes. Again, we don't have to do that. Right? I mean, so... So we we have a particular uh, and unique structure for the way that we look at the need to recuse, and in our rules and in Masons, it's very clear that our duty to make a decision as members of the General Assembly is so great that we shouldn't recuse ourselves unless we have a direct. Uh, I think the word they use is a pecuniary interest in a decision. So. Um, and, but I don't think it's all that different actually in practice. So most of the things we do here, we would have very little ability to um, vote on a question that just impacts us. 
Um, whereas the idea here is like, you wouldn't want to vote on a contract that's specifically for your business um, or a grant that was going to a family member, right? Which is the kind of things that unlikely we as legislators would have. We as legislators vote on things where we might be impacted as part of a large group. For instance, we're all taxpayers. We vote on tax policy. It may raise or lower our taxes, but we're not treating ourselves any differently than we are our neighbors who are similarly situated in that class of people. And so that's, that's where the, the difference um, is, but I actually don't think it's a, a difference that's about treating municipal officials with more scrutiny than us in the general assembly. It's actually just that the nature of the two jobs are a little bit different, but I think that the principles of the state code of ethics are probably the same. And director Silver, do you want to comment on that at all? Sure, I'll say, so legislators, this was the narrow place where legislators were given an exception for constitutional reasons under the Code of Ethics as it was passed. There was a proposition that the, the Code of Ethics should cover um, all public servants equally, which is based mainly what happened, but there were genuine constitutional concerns when it came to legislators and their constitutional responsibilities. And so we looked at what's happening in other states and we agreed that, you know, if there's a carve out in this particular situation, so there is a different standard for legislators and it is because of for constitu state constitutional reasons. Um, so that's how that came about. You can always adopt the higher standard if you wanted to, but the decision was made to leave it as it was for those specific reasons at the time. And I will just say, I just want to um, make clear that it, Filing the a non refusal statement isn't meant to be a punishment. It's meant to increase transparency, but it also can protect the person because there can be a situation where people are accusing that person of having a conflict of interest and that person knows they don't. They could come to the ethics commission and ask and talk it to through and we could agree that you don't, but you'd want to file that non refusal statement so that it's there publicly and you can explain your reasons. And even within that, you can say, I reached out to the ethics commission to get advice. I mean, accurate, so it's an accurate representation, but you know, you can ask for an advisory opinion. Um, so you can say, I recognize there's a conflict. I recognize there's an appearance of one. I'm going to publicly acknowledge it. And so this will hopefully, you know, satisfy people to, within their understanding that I thought this through, um, this was the result. It isn't something that I just blew off and said, I don't care. And again, I think it states in there that in that uh, letter of recusal, you don't have to divulge any personal or um, confidential confidential so yeah if your if your recusal is well if you're recusing yourself then you just have to say that you are recusing based on a conflict if you're going to move forward you're not required to you give client confidential client information you're not required to disclose that something like that okay, thanks other question Anything else you want to leave us with uh, for the weekend as we're? No, just if there's anything I can do. I'll work on distilling this um, as I did with the State Code of Ethics, because I do think that's helpful. And we did that um, for the Senate two years ago, and they appreciated it. Just to show like really what the core principles are here, because I know it gets to get very convoluted about the legal language and the statutory language, but really what we're talking about is pretty basic at the end of the day. So I'll try and work on that. So like that. You don't. Just let me know. Spend <laughs> my time. Hey. Did you want to join us and get some feedback on kind of where we're at right now? I feel like we're in the middle. We're gonna we're gonna transition here and trying to weigh all the different levers, and we've taken out a couple of the things that I think were key concerns for you and for the clerks. But um, I know we probably still have some work to do here over the next week or so. Thanks. The record, Ted Brady from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Uh, just a quick reminder, because there's been some confusion in the committee about what we are. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that provides municipal assistance to uh, serve and strengthen municipalities. There's exactly one and a half people at the league that do uh, advocacy. The other 50 people provide legal opinions to our members, uh, provide uh, risks, unemployment insurance, liability insurance, all these wonderful pooled services and on and on and on. So uh, we are actually an instrumentality of our members. We're not a private nonprofit organization. And every single city and town in the state of Vermont is a member of the league. So we do come here speaking on behalf of our cities and towns. Uh, thanks for the edits that you've made so far. I do want to uh, just point out that uh, we've made several recommendations about how to go about dealing with ethics reform that 
have been dismissed as of now uh, related to centering it at the municipal level. I want to acknowledge that. That's what we're asking you to do. Uh, without that, we did have some recommendations on the language because we think there are problematic elements within the language that uh, if you do not take that advice uh, would be would need to be addressed in order for us to actually operationalize them. That said, the version you have before you still puts a wedge between local officials and the voter and creates, uh, it puts the state between the local official and the voter. So why is that important? Well, to this date, you've heard from exactly two municipal officials. Uh, I think given that this bill would impact more than 6,000 municipal officials around the state of Vermont, elected, appointed, void, you need to hear from some more. Uh, this is a complex thing that you're proposing. It's going to impact day-to-day -day operations in municipalities. It will have an impact. And you need to hear from them about how it will actually impact them. That includes 4,500 municipal employees that we track. There's more than that in the state. It includes 1,200 select board members. It includes 1,000 planning commission members. It includes 1,000 volunteer development review board and zoning board of adjustment members, more than 500 listers, 450 city clerks, treasurers, town clerks, treasurers, and their assistants, auditors, and hundreds of others. When we look through the, the, the language, this is extremely, I think, connected to, I, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, you, you mentioned some things you haven't gotten to yet, halfway there. The training requirement is a good example where this is going to become a problem. We agree that training is the best way to get people to comply with uh, uh, ethics and conflict of interest policies. The problem is you're proposing that all, you know, 6,000 plus people need to be trained and that every town and city in the state is going to retain those records for multiple years. We have town meeting come up. You've been to your town meeting. All those people that run the polls, all those people like bringing potluck goods to a, uh, uh, to a town meeting are covered by your policy as it's written. So they need to get trained in order to do that. That doesn't seem to make much sense to me. Uh, in addition to that, you're looking at what happens if a local municipal official refuses to take the training? Uh, are you proposing that we're going to unseat them someday? Are we proposing that they're going to be fined? Like, there's nothing in this bill that says that, but why would you have a training requirement if there's no repercussion for taking for not taking the training? That's going to come up. Somebody is going to be the person that says, I'm not doing the state tell me what to do. Uh, that's, uh, you know, I have line by line items that I'm concerned about. I don't want to drive you crazy on a Friday afternoon. So I will submit this for a written testimony. But a couple I wanted to really highlight just to give an example of like what gives me Angela. I'm a big guy. I should take better care of myself. <laughs> uh, uh, the, um, there's some pr provisions about the uh, non-recusal process, uh, which are really important, right? The idea that a three person select board that third person's going to have to vote, even if they're conflicted. There is a non-recusal process in there. It doesn't specifically say that if it's the size of the board that's the problem, you can still vote, and uh, even if you don't recuse yourself, because that board needs to needs to operate, right? So I, I think there needs to be a little more work done in that section to specifically allow that. I also think there needs to be more work in that section to recognize how this works. Somebody can't call the Ethics Commission and expect an opinion to be turned around in 24 hours, right? Um, they're going to take time to figure out if there is a conflict. And so there's some timing issues there as well. Uh, I also think there are some issues with, uh, if you go to page, uh, let's see, 10, can't read, I think line seven regarding unauthorized uh, commitments. I, I think that may need some revision because municipal officials can't, make commitments on behalf of their municipality. Now that's just the law. So is it really an ethics issue? But this is a gray area that we keep running into. Also, page 10, I said I'm not gonna do this to all of them, don't worry, there's just two more. Page 10, line 10, regarding benefits from contracts. It's another one of those issues that I, I think the intent is well-meaning, but as the language reads now, you're a select board and you happen to be, you know, the guy that mows the lawn in town, that's just what you do. It not only says you can't vote on that contract, which makes sense, you might need to recuse yourself. It also says you can't take the contract if you recuse yourself, right? You cannot benefit from a contract. So uh, probably needs to be some work there to allow the recusal 
issue. And then that goes back to what if you can't recuse yourself because you're a three person select board? Some concerns uh, there. I am proposing removing some elements of the whistleblower protection provision too, specifically the issues uh, re relating to civil action, uh, which are, God, page 14, I think, lines 10, no, page 15, lines 10 through page, God, page 14, line 10 to page 15, line 11. And again, going back to the ethics training, we think, he, we think removing the requirement is necessary or it's really gonna be complicated. That's it. Those are those are my thoughts. Final reminder: We think we just we'd really like you to hear from some more municipal officials. I have no problem. We have taken a lot of testimony. We are happy to hear from municipal officials. Um, so, if there are folks who would like to suggest, we will get them on the calendar before we move this bill. Of course, Representative Nugent. Um, I just have a clarifying question about the issue you're talking about. Uh, um, if you can't take a job, if you're if you have refused yourself, I wasn't sure. Could you say like more about what the issue is there? Like, yeah, there's a there's a prohibition on benefiting from a contract in the current uh, code, uh, and it doesn't appear. I'm not a lawyer. It doesn't appear. My lawyers also think this doesn't appear. There's a way for you to benefit from a contract, even if you recuse yourself. So let's say you are the only game in town. You are the person that runs the plumbing business. The whatever it is. And you're on the select board, and the select board decides to pick your company to to do work in your town on town land. I think the language as it is now says you can't do that, with good reason, right? There's a nefarious action there that could be occurring, but in small town Vermont, it oftentimes isn't nefarious. It's just the reality of that small town. There's not another plumber for a hundred miles, uh, so that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, no, just to say that is exactly one of the cases in one of my towns. <laughs> we definitely need to work on that provision. Uh, Tim, I hope you're listening and can uh, work with Ted and Director Sibert to try to definitely capture it. But that, um, it's my intention to really go over the, all of the edits. I noticed that the Word doc that, that you had sent has like all of the, the track changes and comments um, from the attorneys at the league. So there's a little homework for me to do over the weekends and uh, a couple of others of us who have been kind of diving into this language um, because I, I do want to work with the league. I'm one of the regrets I have about sort of how this has played out is I, I think it's unfortunate that it's gotten to a place where it feels like the state ethics commission versus the league because we had a specific policy choice to make that Ted in the beginning of your testimony you identified. It's, you know, do we have complaints really go to the ethics commission and have the ethics commission be the home of where, or where those go um, from the public about municipal officials uh, or are we really saying, no, we're going to kind of keep everything down at the municipal level. And that, I, I think after talking to members of the committee and the discussions that we've had, we want to make sure that we're thinking through how this is going to work in practice. But at the same time, there's a consensus that the, the league's role is to support municipalities. And that creates kind of a, a difficult thing for the member of the public, you know, to hear the, the uh, commission's chair testify earlier to go to the municipality and then they get support from the league who's supporting that member of the public who's totally independent and doesn't have a, a dog in the fight and the league we enormously respect the league the work that you all do for our towns i was a municipal official for six years this is not a dig on the league i don't want anybody to walk away from this conversation thinking that this committee or the state ethics commission don't respect the league but in in this deci policy decision frame that we have around who's the home and the arbiter of some of these complaints. We want to make sure that the code is clear. That's the work I want to do over the next couple of weeks. The, but the, there has to be a place where there isn't any dog in the fight. That's what we're trying to do. And the league has to support towns. That's your whole mission. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's, I just wanted to really get on the record here that like we're, we're not trying to create an animosity between us and the league or the ethics commission and the league. We, we really want to work with you to get something that will benefit Vermonters out of this bill. Thanks for saying that. I appreciate it. 
I know that many of you have served in local government. I know many of you are familiar with the sentiment that they don't want Montpelier uh, intervening in local affairs. And generally, this committee's been pretty good about saying we recognize there needs to be that balance. So I appreciate it. Trying to find balance. And uh, on this one, it was a little harder than I thought. Uh, but we're trying to make the time to do it right. Um, so thanks, Ted. Anything else you want to leave us with? Friday. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so we'll do a little work yeah, over the close. <laughs> we'll do a little work over the, the weekend. I'm sure there'll be some emails flying back and forth Monday, Tuesday, and we'll try to get back to this on Wednesday and be a little bit closer to sending this thing on its way. And if it needs a little bit more time, we'll have the week after time you break too. <laughs> Don't totally run out the clock, but uh, it's not going to be like a big appropriations or ways and means conversation about these bills. Uh, <laughs> Now that I've said that, I've yeah, probably right. never regret it. Yeah, it's out there. So uh, thank you for all the great work. Uh, thank you to the commissioners and the folks for being here today and hearing this. Um, if there are thoughts that folks have that didn't make it in today, please email Andrew and me, members of the committee. Uh, this has been a big week. Uh, there's next week, we're going to have a ton of work, and then we'll have a week off for time meeting break. So um, I wanted to tell the committee before we adjourn that um, we will be meeting at nine um, to pick up um, on Tuesday when we get back, we'll be meeting at nine to uh, take a look at H629 um, and make sure that we we're looking to the GovOps jurisdictional questions um, that we didn't really focus on when we did the drive-by of that abatement bill that includes the elements from 641. Uh, but there were some questions about that this morning. That's why we delayed action on that. So this coming Tuesday, that'll be, be this coming Tuesday at nine. So we'll be we'll be uh, meeting early in order to take some testimony. We're going to hear from uh, you know, hopefully a number of different stakeholders about um, how that bill <laughs> landed in ways and means uh, outside of the sections we've already reviewed ad nauseum. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Representative Chase, go. It's delayed for two days, so that'll be on Wednesday. Yeah, and we'll have Tuesday and Wednesday before three to look at. Exactly. If we flag concerns on Tuesday or want to hear additional testimony, we would have a little bit yeah. more time. And we could always ask that our colleagues on Ways and Means give us a little bit more time if we feel like we need it. So we just want to make sure that we respect our process. And that was the better part of Valor sometimes is to pump the brakes. Uh, Representative Cooper. I don't know if we've talked about this or considered it, but... Uh, Including the surgical issue in the OPR bill seems like it could be either a mechanism for it not to get reviewed by the members enough or a big rock to take it down to the bottom of the pond. I wonder if we, I'm not asking for an answer, I'm putting this out for consideration. I wonder if we should consider that as maybe a committee standalone as opposed to rolling it into something that just deals with everything. So I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, I was able to talk to a few of you individually. And I think just after the initial testimony we heard yesterday, there is a variety of opinion on this committee about whether or not we should try to tackle this. Uh, I really appreciate the suggestion of doing it as a standalone. Um, I would like to take some more testimony on it. I do not want to bog down the OPR bill, and I do not, especially since we're adding, as of today, a couple more things that we're going to try to squeeze in for crossover. I think where I'm at right now is if um, we want to continue to work on this, we could um, draft a bill that includes those recommendations to represent Cooper's suggestion, um, that we could get the OPR bill out with the other elements um, and that we could after crossover when we're not quite so um, under the gun time wise, we could consider that standalone, take some testimony if the committee's interested in doing that um, and, you know, potentially either include that as an amendment when the OPR bill comes back uh, or something like that. So I, I think my impression here is that there's not a clear answer um, and that we would need to really take some significant testimony to get to a place where a majority of folks on the committee felt like they had enough information to make an informed decision. Um, that was part of why I wanted to have, you know, the sort of, here's the report, here's the high level on both sides of it. 
yesterday was to get to a place where I felt like enough of you had been able to say, I don't know, I need to know a lot more before I want to vote yes or no on this. Um, Cause they're, it's not clear and it hasn't been for years. I would love with all the work that went into that report to be able to just honor the work that OPR did either way with a, with a clear decision about we're going one way or, or we're not um, this year, but all of the other things we have before us are just going to take a lot. So I don't know how folks feel about that approach of taking a little more testimony on it after crossover, but I think that that's the compromise I want to suggest to all of you. Representative Cooper. I find that more discussion satisfactory. I uh, I think that the, the downside in some of the stuff that we're talking about is we expand the field of individuals that are capable of doing something. I don't know whether it's baseball, motorcycle riding, or basketball. You get better when you practice a lot. It just doesn't seem to me like there would be enough of the procedures to keep everybody sharp. Well, I think if we take more testimony, we should really look at the market and what OPR's information in them. That's the other thing I'll say. The first thing, need and cost, is something they didn't address, which seems to be typical to some I, They tried to address it, but they got conflicting information, is what I heard loud and clear yeah. yesterday, which is tough for us because we'd love somebody who's an expert to tell them what to do. <laughs> which is kind of, kind of with, across all the questions that this issue brings up. That's the problem is the experts are telling you opposite things, right? So, so without turning this into a policy conversation right now, totally not what I'm doing. I completely <laughs> support what you're saying. No, I'm not buying it. I'm just trying to end it. No, um, I think taking the, the time to really do a, a, a comprehensive conversation, bring some more testimony from stakeholders after crossover and whether we include it in OPR later, committee will it, move it, whatever. There's a couple of options that we could pursue. Mm -hmm. We keep this conversation going. It's a years long conversation. Both sides have a lot of emotions on it. And I don't think we can do it justice in the next eight legislative days. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Correct. Representative Hanga. Thank you. I'm, I'm rather relieved to hear that. And I have one thought to put this in perspective. We are taking something, um, a set of skills that is typically has been historically regulated by the Board of Medical Practice and putting it into our committee bucket because the Board of Medical Practice is upstairs with healthcare committee. So now in our bucket into the Office of Professional Regulation because they are the ones who regulate optometrists. So I'm not comfortable with moving from that jurisdiction up there that really understands medical practice to us who are not medical professionals making that decision. Oh, and I, and I, I think the thing I would leave with is <clears throat> regardless of whether or not we take up a, a scope expansion, it won't be the legislature that's regulating the profession. And the, you know, we, we get into this all the time with scope expansion, where we as citizen legislators are being asked by the regulatory bodies to you know, approve the statute uh, on behalf of the people of Vermont. But for us to, you know, we are not going to play board of medicine here. Uh, that's that kind of really we're going to be at. It's no, my good. point is, I, I agree. And my point is that. OPR shouldn't be the board of medical practice either. So I, I will leave it at that. I agree with Lisa. This seems to some degree like putting a Cessna pilot in Apollo 13 and saying, go with blood. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it sounds like there'll be some pretty fiery uh, debate about this when we get around to it. But it'll, it'll, it's, back on that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm glad we have a couple of weeks with a long break in between. <laughs> All right. Uh, great work this week, everybody. Let's adjourn and go off live.